Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tebedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And in this particular chapter, we are discussing about the application of recombinant DNA technology. If you recall, in the previous lecture, we discussed about the application of recombinant DNA technology in terms of generation of the uh, transgenic uh, plants or transgenic organisms, right. So, in when we were discussing about the transgenic organisms, we discussed about the transgenic uh, plants and we discuss about the benefits and as well as the disadvantage of or ethical concern related to these transgenic uh, organisms. Now, in today's lecture, we are going to discuss about the transgenic animals and then we also going to discuss some more aspects related to the application of recombinant DNA technology. Now, if you would like to utilize the recombinant DNA technology for any kind of applications, what you are supposed to do is you are supposed to generate a recombinant clone and that we have discussed in our previous two lectures, right. We have discussed about how you can be able to isolate a gene of your interest, uh, which could be either by uh, isolating it from the genomic library or either from the cDNA library or utilizing the site, uh, site directed uh, site specific uh, primers with the help of the polymerase chain reactions. Once you have the gene fragment, then you are actually going to digest these gene fragment with the help of a restriction enzyme. And then the you are going to use the ligase uh, en enzyme and then you are going to have the uh, ligated product and that is going to be the recombinant DNA. This recombinant DNA then you are going to deliver into the host cells and that is how you are actually going to have the uh, uh, genetically modified organisms. These genetically modified organisms could be uh, of very, very uh, important in terms of the environmental issues, in terms of the providing the better products or it could be of the different types of properties. So, in the previous lecture, we discussed about the genetically modified or transgenic animals, uh, transgenic uh, plants. Now, in today's lecture, we are going to discuss about the transgenic animals. So, uh, when we talk about the uh, transgenic animals, uh, transgenic animals uh, uh, have the foreign DNA deliberately inserted into the genome to express the desired gene product. These gene product uh, could be of multiple types uh, depending upon the type of transgenic animals or transgenic uh, plant uh, animal is going to be produced. They are produced using the several common uh, molecular genetic techniques such as uh, DNA pore nuclear macro injections, embryonic stem cell mediated gene transfer or the retrovirus mediated gene transfer. So, there are three methods through which you can be able to generate the transgenic uh, animals. Number one is the DNA pore nuclear micro injections, the number two is embryonic stem cell mediated gene transfer or the number three is retrovirus mediated gene transfer. So, uh, in a particular uh, transgenic animal protocol, what you are going to do is you are going to isolate the gene from uh, the organisms, right. So, you are going to actually a DNA sequence containing the human uh, gluc uh, gene is going to be isolated and uh, the gene of insert, right. Then the cells from the ear of a goat are multiplied from a small or the auricular biopsy. Then a uh, then a cell transfection procedure is being carried out using an electrical discharge. It causes the membrane of the goat cell to open allow the, uh, in, uh, the integration of the gene into the genome. So, that is how you have actually isolated a gene from the hum uh, humans. You have isolated the cells from the goat. Then you did the uh, gene delivery protocol. So, you have actually did the electroporation and that is how the gene is going to be inserted into the cell. And then the uh, you are the so the so the best and then you are going to screen the, the transgenic uh, cells. So, the best transgenic cells are selected and inserted into the goat oocyst from which the maternal DNA had been removed. So, you are actually going to take the oocyst from the uh, goat cells 
and then you are actually going to remove its original nucleus so that it should not express the gene from the original nucleus and then you are actually going to insert this uh, recombinant uh, DNA. Then uh, you are going to have the another the electroporation procedure and then uh, there are um, embryos which are going to be generated okay, where the human gene is going to be uh, in, you know present right. And uh, to determine whether the gene is present, the protein can be present, protein can be uh, you know analyzed with the help of the western blotting, and the you can actually be able to use the many of the west, uh, blotting techniques, such as for example, you can actually be able to do the southern blotting to see whether the gene is been integrated into the genome or not. And then you can do the northern blotting to see whether the protein is uh, you know the whether the RNA is being synthesized from that particular gene or not. And then you can be able to do the western blotting to see whether that particular gene is being expressing or not. And then ultimately you are going to have the uh, uh, the transgenic goat which is actually going to express this particular protein and because of this particular protein it is actually going to have the uh, different variants of the milk. So, in order to become a medication the milk protein has to be purified and transformed and transported into the injectable product. So, you are from this goat you are going to get the milk and that milk is actually going to have the uh, protein and that protein either can be purified from the milk and that is how you are actually going to have a uh, medicine. So, this is just a general protocol how you are uh, uh, how you are going to do a transgenic animal and what is the advantage of transgenic animal. Now, let us move on to the uh, techniques through which you can be able to generate a transgenic uh, uh, animal. So, the first technique is the DNA pro nuclear micro injections. So, uh, in the DNA pro nuclear micro injections what you are going to do is you are actually going to use a fine needle ok and the DNA solution is injected into the male pronuclei. This is done with the extreme precision to avoid damaging the egg right. So, using a fine glass needle the DNA solution is injected into the male pronuclei. This is done with the and then the injected DNA might or might not integrate into the genome of the egg and this is why the selectable uh, markers are included into the construct. The embryos that have been given the transgenic uh, uh, injections are grown in vitro and are subsequently implanted into the uterus of the foster mother. So, what you are going to do in this is uh, you are going to take the egg ok and then uh, you are actually going to uh, inject the, uh, the DNA from the uh, male pronuclei and uh, that is how they will be actually going to fuse to give you a zygote and then these zygotes are actually going to be implemented uh, implanted into the uterus of the um, mother and these uh, some of these embryos probably will go, um, grow and they will be actually going to give you the uh, DNA. Uh, this is one of the easiest strategies employed to produce the transgenic animals. Uh, super ovulated females are produced by the hormone treatment and they are mated with the males. Just after fertilization the egg contains a small uh, female pronuclei and a large male pronucleus. In the pronuclear microinjection technique the transgene is directly injected into the large male pronucleus ok. So, what you are going to do is uh, you are actually this is a very simple technique where what you have is you are actually going to take the super ovulated female. So, this means you are actually going to inject the female hormones into the male uh, sorry female hormones uh, in a large quantity. So, that the female are actually going to produce lot of eggs and then these eggs are actually going to and then you allow these females to go for the mating. After the mating they will be uh, you know there will be eggs which are actually going to contain the, uh, the female, uh, female pronucleus and a large male nucleus. Now, if you target this large pronucleus and then you with the help of the needle you just inject directly the transgene into this uh, large uh, male nucleus. And as a result what will happen is there will be a fusion of this uh, uh, transgene with the male nucleus and that is how the male nucleus is going to start producing the uh, 
the the it, it will actually start producing the transgenic uh, gene it is going to start expressing the transgene and that is how you are going to have the transgenic uh, animal. Now, the second technique is the embryonic stem cell uh, mediated gene transfer. So, embryonic stem cells are the cell that under the influence of different signal can differentiate into the different types of cells right and this is the definition of the embryonic stem cell. So, they can actually be if you take the embryonic stem cell they could be differentiated into the uh, macrophages, they can be differentiated into the skin cell, they can be differentiated into the heart, lungs, liver, pancreas in any of those cells right. And that is why this means they are actually going to have the enormous potential of getting the differentiation and de differentiations. Embryonic stem cell mediated gene transfer is a sophisticated te technique used to create the genetically modified animals especially the mice for studying the gene functions or the disease mechanism and for the various biotechnical applications. The embryonic stem cells are collected from the inner cell mass of the blastocyst stage and the cultured in a media that contain the leukemia inhibitor factor or LIF to maintain their pluripotency. Okay? So, you do not have to worry about these terms that we look what is mean by pluripotency and all that kind of thing. So, what you are going to do is uh, you are going to take the embryonic stem cells and in embryonic stem cells you are going to collect from the blastocyst and then you are going to culture them into the in vitro system. So, that is what you are going to do is you are going to take the embryonic stem cells and then you are going to culture that into a cultural plate right. And uh, while you they are culturing you can actually be able to inject the DNA what you would like. So, you this is going to be a transgene. Uh, which you can inject with the help of the different types of DNA delivery methods. And then you are going to select the cells which are expressing the desired gene. So, at this stage uh, you may have to perform the uh, different types of blotting techniques. So, you can actually be able to perform the southern blotting, you can be able to do the northern blotting and you can be able to do the western blotting. Okay. Uh, Remember that in the previous lecture we discuss about these uh, te blotting techniques. So, with the southern blotting it will tell you whether the transgene uh, is being integrated or not, integrated into the genome or not. With the northern gene, uh, northern blotting it is going to tell you whether the it, this transgene is forming the messenger RNA or not. Okay. And with the western blotting it was actually going to tell you whether the protein is being expressing or not. And that is kind of a confirmation and based on these properties you may actually be able to select the cells also. It's like there are cells which may have the transgenes which may have the transgene and they will be positive in the southern blotting. They may be positive in the northern blotting, but there are some issue maybe the promoter is not good or something happens it may not be expressing a desired protein or it may be expressing a protein, but the protein is uh, of the uh, you know the either degraded or something right. So, you should not ex you should not use those uh, uh, cells right. You select the cells which are actually going to where you are going to found the DNA where you could found the messenger RNA and where you could found the uh, protein product in a uh, adequate quantity and uh, your desirable uh, 3D conformations. Uh, then you inject these transformed uh, embryonic stem cells into the inner cell mass right. So, you are going to inject them back into the blastocyst right and then the inner cell mass is going to grow and there you are actually going to inject these uh, transformed uh, embryonic stem cells and then they will be implanted into the uterus right and once you implanted this into the uterus of a foster mother uh, I am sure you know about the foster mother, foster mother means the uh, false mother right. Uh, this guy uh, there are two mothers right uh, you are going to have the real mother where who will be getting the embryo by the fertilization and then you are going to have the foster mother which is actually going to only carry the uh, your uh, transformed cells or you are actually going to carry the embryo which you have produced in the other uh, females. So, then you test the offsprings for the presence of the gene again you will do the same kind of analysis even into the offsprings which means you are actually going to get the mice and then you can actually be able to test whether the mice cells are uh, 
uh, showing the uh, integration of the uh, gene into the genome whether they are ex, uh, you know forming the messenger RNA or whether they are forming the protein also or not. Then the male heterozygous offsprings to produce the homozygous uh, transgenic strain which means initially you are actually going to produce a male heterozygous okay, which means because sometime what happen is and I am sure you probably know about what is mean by the heterozygous and what is mean by the homozygous. Heterozygous means uh, the gene is only present on the one copy of the chromosome right. You know that you everybody has a two set of chromosome right. You are actually going to have uh, 23 pairs of chromosome and then you also have XY or XX actually. So, these 23 pairs are having the, uh, the cognate pairs right. So, you are going to have a homologous pair. This means if a, a organism is going to be heterozygous when a particular gene is present on one pair, but it is not present on the other pair and that is being called as heterozygous. And when you have a heterozygous conditions, the proteins are only going to express, but they will not going to be expressed at the full uh, high uh, level right. And as a result of that these uh, heterozygous uh, males may actually may show you the genotypic uh, changes, but they may not show you the phenotypic changes. And uh, this is very good because you can actually be able to test whether the protein which you are expressing may not be lethal uh, for the uh, for the organism right. In some cases uh, the, the gene product may be interfering with the animals uh, normal uh, metabolism and all those kind of that is why they are lethal actually. So, when you produce the heterozygous you will see that they are sick, but they are not dying. When you produce the homozygous which means when you cross breed the two heterozygous uh, 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 species or two heterozygous uh, animals they are actually going to give you a homozygous right. And as, as soon as they will produce the homozygous and if this gene product is lethal they will actually going to kill the organisms and that will actually going to be a warning sign that I should not go with the uh, ectopic expression of this particular gene into this particular system because it is ultimately going to give you the, uh, the death of that particular organisms. Once you are sure about this then you can implant this into the uterus and uh, once you implanted this it is actually going to give you the, uh, the uh, animals and they are actually going to give you the animals and that animals can be used for the downstream applications. So, the uh, this is uh, early show I have discussed the cultured embryonic stem cells are treated with a solution of the DNA construct and taken up by the cell. The transformed cells are injected into the inner cell of the blastocyst and implanted in the uterus of a foster mother. The offsprings are then monitored for the expression of these trans genes. A big example of this delivery method is the chimeras. These organisms have the at least two genetically distinct cell lineage originating from the different zygotes. And then we have a third method and the third method is called as the retrovirus mediated gene transfer. So, in the retrovirus mediated transgenesis is a technique you use to introduce the foreign gene into the host animal genome utilizing the retroviruses. Retroviruses examples are HIV or human immunodeficiency virus right. The genetic material of the retrovirus is RNA and these vectors stably integrate into the foreign DNA into the host genome specifically early, early embryon embryos or the uh, ES cells actually. The uh, advantage of this method is that the location of the integration is specific and it reduces the chances of mutation into the host genome. So, uh, what we are doing what we are doing is we are producing a transgene okay and then we are packaging that transgene into a virus right and then this virus is binding on to the, the uh, binding on the receptor onto the cell and then it is delivering the gene of interest and uh, the double standard DNA is going to be delivered right. Then this double standard DNA will enter into the genome and that is how it is actually going to be integrated into the genome of that cell. So, virus uncoating, uh, reverse transcription, second strand synthesis all these is going to happen uh, by the machinery of the retrovirus and then ultimately it is actually going to give you the gene of interest and that gene of interest is going to be integrated into the genome and that is how it is actually going to give you the protein synthesis. 
It is as most important to note that the safety concerns regarding retroviruses are extremely high. For this reason, the vir vector must be made replication incompetent, it cannot replicate into the host cells. The retroviral vectors are transfected into a packeting cell that provides the necessary virus protein required to produce a complete recombinant retrovirus. The complete virus particles are harvested from the culture media of the packaging cells. So, this is very very important that the safety is a very very high concern when you are using the retrovirus and that is why you know that the virus has two um, component. One is the coat proteins and uh, plus you are actually going to have the uh, genomic DNA right. You are going to have two component if you mix them together it is actually going to give you a functionally active virus particle. So, when you are actually using the retroviruses, some of these coat proteins you are not adding onto the same viral uh, DNA where the, uh, so suppose uh, a coat protein uh, is required and suppose you have 5 coat protein which is required for making the coat of the virus. Then what you do is you, you put all these 5 into 5 different vectors, right. So, you are going to have one vector, second vector, third vector, fourth vector and fifth vector. So, when you will put them together and you will put along with the viral DNA which actually contains the transgene, it is actually going to produce the virus particles and these virus particles are going to be taken up by the cell and that is how it is actually going to form. But in a due course of time, these uh, plasmids are actually going to be uh, er eradicated or they will not be available for providing their protein product and as a result the viral DNA will still be present, but it will not getting packed into a functionally active virus particle and that is why you are keeping a control over the self replication of these retroviruses. Because if there will be a self replication of these uh, retroviruses, they may actually going to create or they may actually cause the disease because they acquired a uh, self replication and you are actually. Uh, you know going to treat the animal cells with this uh, particular virus. So, if a person is not even having the disease, it may actually develop the disease because this particular virus is going to be self replicating and to avoid that what you are doing is you are putting the, uh, the coat protein onto the plasmids, the different uh, DNA and the viral DNA which contains the transgenes. So, as a result as long as these two are putting together, they will actually going to form the functional virus particle which you are going to use into the transfection study or which you are going to use for transactions. But as soon as the transaction is over, these plasmids because every DNA molecule has a age right or the life, they will get degraded okay, over the course of time right. And as a result, uh, virus ap, uh, active virus production is going to be stopped. The stable integration embryos or stem cells are finally implanted in the uterus of a foster mother and allowed to grow. The progenies are screened and selected for the desired gene products. So, we have we have discussed about the three uh, different uh, uh, methods right we and utilizing these three different methods you can be able to produce the transgenic animals right. Now, once you produce the transgenic animals, they can be first of all there will be a diversity in terms of what kind of transgenic animals you have produced and then uh, depending upon the diversity, you can also be able to have the different types of applications from these transgenic animals. So, let us take a few examples of these transgenic animals and what are their applications. So, the first transgenic animals, so we have taken the class of fish right because fish is very very important economically important right because fish is a uh, stable product uh, product for the consumption. So, the first uh, uh, transgenic animal is the super fish right. Super fish are bigger in size you see that this is a normal fish and this is the transgenic fish right. So, you see how big it is actually. So, it is a edible fish right super fish it is increased the growth and the size and why it is so because why it has a very high size because the growth hormone gene is being integrated into the genome and because of because you if you produce a very high quantity of growth hormone it is actually going to give you the uh, increase in the length and increase of the um, body mass. Uh, 
For example, the transgenic salmon which grow about 10 to 11 times faster than the normal fish right and uh, this is very very important because you if you if the fish will grow very big the, it is actually going to be uh, very uh, it will have a very high uh, volume right and it is also going to be good for the consumption. Then the second is glow fishes. So, glow fishes are the transgenic fishes where you are expressing the fluorescent proteins and uh, the different types of fluorescent protein like the green fluorescent proteins, cyan fluorescent protein, red fluorescent protein combination of these two proteins and so on. So, that is why you see these fishes are actually going to give you the fluorescence into the aquarium and that is why they are of different colors right. So, you can have the uh, yellow uh, or golden color, you can have the red color, you can have the blue color and you can have a green color. So, and uh, these glow fishes are very, very uh, popular and they are very, very uh, uh, high in demand for the aquarium people. So, these are the ornamental fishes and uh, they are actually expressing the fluorescent uh, colored genes and uh, what they are doing is they are actually expressing the fluorescent protein and uh, people are using the glow fishes. Glow fishes is a uh, general term. Uh, people are developing the glow fishes into the gold fishes, people are developing the gold fishes into the different types of fishes what is available into the aquarium. So, if there are normal fishes, there are glow fishes. The glow fishes are going to give you the fluorescence in the night, the, the normal fishes are not. Then we also have the zebra fishes. So, zebra fishes are uh, you know uh, having the optically clear shell and they are actually being used for the study and the cure of different disease model. And uh, the glow zebra fishes are also being used into the aquarium sometime. So, that is what the advantage of having a zebra fish. Uh, then we also have the grass carp. So, grass carp is a uh, being used and this is a transgenic grass carp where you are actually putting the human lactoferrin gene. So, it is actually going to give you the uh, lactoferrin production and that is how it is actually going to give you the milk proteins. Then we have the in uh, enviro pig. So, enviro pigs are the pig variety. Uh, so, it is uh, going to use the better digestion against the phytate and uh, how you are doing this? You are actually integrating the phytase gene from the E. coli. So, because of this phytase gene, it is actually going to digest the uh, some of the uh, plants. Uh, they are also being used for the organ transplant. Remember that the uh, the pigs are close, very closely related to the humans, and uh, not only in terms of the physiology, but in terms of the size of the organism or organs also. And that's why the there are trials that where you can actually be able to use the organ from the fish uh, for organ from the pig for the under transplants. Then we have the transgenic cows, right? So, you, transgenic cows are being developed for having the higher nutritional values where you are actually over expressing the human lactoferrin gene. So, when you are developing uh, over expressing the human lactoferrin genes, these transgenic cows gives the milk with lysozymes, lactoalbumins, and clotting factors uh, 8 and 9, etcetera. So, this is actually going to increase the therapeutic value of that particular milk and it is actually going to be in a very big demand in the European countries. So, this uh, and then we also have the transgenic uh, bull right. So, in the year of 1990, the first transgenic bull Herman it was created and the cow milk which actually lays the lactoferrin is also being uh, supplemented because of this uh, transgenic cows. And uh, what you are doing is you are putting the human lactoferrin gene and it, it is produced by a method which is called as pro nuclear micro injection. So, remember that we discuss about the three method where we, one method we are using the pro nuclear micro injection, the second method we are using the uh, stem cell and the third method where you are using the retroviruses. Then we also have the transgenic rabbits. Right. So, the, in the year of 1985, the first transgenic rabbit was produced and it was produced by the pore nuclear micro injection carrying the transgene. And this is a model for the cardiovascular diseases of CVD, uh, AIDS and the cancer and the human arthropoietin uh, alpha glucosidase and the human AAT are the genes which are being uh, used for producing the transgenic rabbit. 
and depending upon the different types of proteins uh, you are actually going to develop the uh, transgenic uh, rabbit for the different types of applications. Then we also have the transgenic chicken right. So, this is produced by the infecting uh, embryos with the viral vector carrying the transgenes and you can actually be able to uh, you know put the any human protein into the transgene and that is how the it is actually going to increase the economical as well as the therapeutic value of the egg. So, it is actually going to increase the additional value 0.1 grams of human protein into the each egg. So, it is actually going to produce very high quantity of the human proteins and uh, human proteins and other advantage is that when you produce the human protein it is actually going to produce with the correct sugar glycosylation pattern which means if the glycosylation pattern is very very important for uh, using these protein in a function in a in a subsequent steps like the uh, for example if you would like to use this protein as a vaccine uh, material or whether you use for these proteins for the therapeutic supplements it, it, the glycosylation is very very important right. So, this is the transgenic chicken. Then we also have the super mouse which has been developed in the year of 1982. So, you see this is a super mouse and uh, this is the normal mouse that is this is the normal mouse right. So, the this super mouse has a better digestion against the phyte and the human growth uh, hormone is being over expressed into the super mouse. They are big in size and they are mouse mo they are being used for the mouse model of the different diseases. Then we have a transgenic uh, monkey. So, the in the year of 1990 the first transgenic monkey ND was developed. Uh, this transgenic monkey was having the GFP protein which, which was from the jellyfish. So, it is expressing the green fluorescent protein from the jellyfish and it is produced by the pro nuclear micro injection method and this is a disease model for the cancer AIDS Alzheimer disease and it is very very popular. Now, what is the application of transgenic animals? So, there are multiple uh, areas where the transgenic animals could be used. So, first is uh, the understanding of the disease mechanism, the second is understanding of the normal physiology, the third is the biological product, number four you can actually be able to have the vaccine safety and then number five you can actually also have be used for these enzyme these transgenic animals for the toxicity testing. Now, as far as the uh, transgenic animal is concerned you can actually be have a, the two different variety of transgenic animals. The transgenic animals where you are actually going to over express a protein or where you are actually going to remove a protein. So, in a over expression protein these are only always been used in those cases where you are either over expressing a protein. So, that the therapeutic or the nutritional value of that product my uh, product from the animal is going to be increased or in general the, uh, the animal itself is actually going to carry that particular gene. So, that is one advantage. In a knockout you are actually going to remove the gene expressing functional gene and that is useful for understanding the role of that particular protein into uh, any kind of disease mechanism. So, I am sure you might have when we were discussing about the transgenic animals you might have seen that we have said that these transgenic animals are a very good uh, model for understanding the disease mechanisms related to the cardiovascular diseases. Alzheimer's, cancer, AIDS and also on. So, for any of these diseases you are actually going to produce a transgenic animals and then you are actually going to create the particular disease conditions and in those disease conditions because we already know that this particular protein will actually going to have a role uh, these transgenic animals are actually going to helpful in terms of not only understanding the disease mechanism, but also for screening the therapeutic molecules or screening the inhibitors for example. There are many examples where you are um, for example, uh, apo uh, proteins and so on they are very good for uh, you know the Alzheimer um, uh, model or atherosclerosis model and uh, you can actually be able to use that for screening the different types of inhibitors to see whether that particular inhibitor can be used for that particular disease. 
Similarly, you can actually be able to use these uh, for the normal physiology. So, you can actually be able to for example, I can use a knockout mice okay? and I can use knockout mice and say whether what will be the role of actin in the muscle contractions. right? So, I can remove the actin or I can generate the conditioned knockout all these are uh, way beyond your syllabus, but suppose I generate uh, actin uh, knockout then that will actually going to impair the muscular contractions and other kinds of events and that is how you can be able to study what will be the role of actin or you can actually be able to generate the mutants and uh, uh, replace the wild type with the mutant and that is how you can be able to ask these kind of questions. Then you can also be able to use these knockout mites for the different types of products. For example, you can be able to use these for production of the arthropoietin, you can use these for production of lactoferrin, you can use these for developing the different types of vaccines and, uh, and so on. And then uh, vaccine safety, right. Uh, so, when you are developing a vaccine, right, you can actually be able to have two choices. One, you can actually be able to inject this vaccine into a human and then you can ask whether it is giving the protection or not. Right? In this process, you are actually uh, sacrificing or you are actually putting the life of these humans into danger because if in case suppose you are testing a vaccine for HIV for example. Right? Now, if you are testing only on the real human beings, then you are actually going to inject the HIV virus right? uh, and, you, and suppose you injected the vaccine. Right? Now, these are vaccinated people. But you once you inject the HIV, they may develop the disease, they may not develop the disease, right? And uh, if they develop the disease, they are actually going to be HIV patient, right? And ultimately, they may die because the disease is being not having any permanent cure. But uh, apart from this, uh, you can actually able to do the same experiment in a animal, in a transgenic animal. So what you can do is you can actually be able to develop a humanized mice. So, where this mice is actually going to have the immune system from the uh, behaving like a uh, human system. So, if you can actually take the human humanized mice and you there the immune system is belonging to the humans and uh, then you can actually be able to infect this with HIV. So, you can actually be able to put the vaccine, you can actually be inject the human so, ultimately if the, if the experiment does not uh, you know go as per your plan, at least these mice were only get the hum, uh, vaccine, uh, HIV not, not the humans. And there are other, other cases where the, the testing itself is a problem right. So, and same is true for the uh, toxicity testing right. When you are testing a toxicity of a drug molecules, you have a choice either you use the real humans or you actually can use the transgenic animals and uh, that is why you are going to use the transgenic animals because the animals are uh, you know these animals are meant for doing these kind of experiments. So, uh, I have also listed some of the applications of the transgenic uh, organisms. So, this includes actually the both the animals and the plants. So, transgenic plants and animals have a various application across the several fields. It has helped us ad, uh, advance in several factors such as agriculture, medicines, medicinal industry and as well as the environmental management. The progress of transgenic organism through time has helped to enhance the nutritional gain from the plants and then as well as animal. It has also produced more resistant plant and animals so that the both farmers and breeders have lower losses and abundant gain at the end of the each session. The generation of transgenic organism have also paved the way to create the newer breed with a specific social role. For example, the more muscular dog have been produced that helps in the maintenance of the security along with the police as well as the military forces. And all these advantages have paved the way for the immeasurable growth in the transgenic organisms. One major goal of transgenics is to increase the crop yield. So, what is the role of transgenic and plants into the agriculture? So, one of the major uh, area where the transgenic plants are 
doing is they are actually increasing that uh, crops nutritional quality to cater the need of the growing population. Remember when we were discussing about the introduction we said that how you are actually going to overcome the food shortage for the 9.7 billion people right. So, this is one of the way you are actually going to use the recombinant DNA technology to produce a transgenic plant and that transgenic plant is actually going to overcome the shortage of the food because the same plant which was giving or the normal plant which was giving 1 kg of rice the, uh, the transgenic plant may be resistant for the disease conditions and they may also give you the 2.5 kg ok. So, pathogens like bacteria, fungi, viruses and insects along with the several abiotic stresses have plowed the uh, growth of the crop for several decades. With the advancement in the production of the genetically modified organisms, cultivars with the increased resistance to both biotic and abiotic stress have been developed. This allows the farmers to grow crop in the large quantity with the increased resistance to the pathogen and the harsh environmental conditions. A common example of such cross is the Bt cotton. It has increased resistance to the insect, right? I mean, Bt cotton is very, very popular and uh, it has been also under very um, controversies. But uh, so these insect resistance crops have been produced by introducing the Bt gene, which is also known as the cry gene, isolated from the Bacillus thumbogenesis. And that is how this Bacillus uh, gene product is actually a toxic for the insects and that is how it is providing the resistance into the plant for the, uh, for the insect resistance. The Bt cotton, uh, the Bt cotton encode for a toxin that is uh, determined for the specific insects. Several classes of the Bt genes are effective for the different insects and ineffective for the other. For example, the cry uh, AC and cry 1C, 1AC and the cry 2SB code for a toxin that control the cotton uh, bollworms, whereas the cry 1AB in code for a toxin that control the corn borers. Several Bt crops have been produced like the rice, maize, tomato, brinzel. Many of these transgenic crops are growing and uh, grown commercially resulting in a significant yield increase. Another example is the golden rice which has an increased exposure of vita expression of vitamin A which results in the golden color of the rice and hence the name. Several transgenic crops have been produced in the past two decades with desirable traits, better yield and the nutritional qualities. The table in the following slide shows the different transgenic crops that have been produced in the past decade and as well as, well as their desirable traits. So, this is the simple uh, table which actually says that what will be the uh, transgenic plant we have growing and what is the uh, source of transgenes and what is the uh, its uh, uh, its applications. So, you have a corn, a corn actually, so corn is actually having a source of gene from the bacteria or other species of the corn and because of this transgenic corn you are these transgenic corns are having a resistance to the insects, they are tolerant to the herbicides, they are male corn sterility, alpha amylase expressions, increased lysine level for use in animal feeds and the reduction of the yield loss under the water limited conditions. Then we have a cotton, so cotton we have a taken out the bacteria, uh, bacteria which is like uh, Bacillus thumbogenesis like the Bt cotton right and it is having a tolerance to the herbicides and it is resistant to the insects. Then we have a soybean, soybean you are expressing the transgene from the bacteria, corn, oats, soybean and because of this it is actually going to have the different types of applications. So, it is going to be tolerant to the herbicides, it is going to have high oleic acid soybean oil and it is resistant to the insects. Then we have a canola, right? canola is a oil. right? It is going to have the um, transgenes from the bacteria, mustard and uh, fungus and it is also tolerance to the herbicides. It is fertility restorations and uh, male canola sterility and degradation of phyte in the animal foods. Then we have the transgenic plants, uh, their application into the industrial production. So, 
Lipid organisms are a factory on their own. The advancement of the biotechnology has enabled us to utilize this power and convert the plants into a manufacturing unit for their own. Several biomolecules are generated by this method and it has been famously dubbed as molecular forming, right? So, molecular forming is where you are actually putting the transgene inside a, a particular plant or a plant and then the plant is utilizing that transgene, producing that trans product and that is how it is actually going to require no additional support from outside. This involves the genetic modification of the plant by either incorporating the gene of interest into the plant or multiplying the number of genes into the plants. These foreign genes are incorporated into the nuclear genome or the chloroplast DNA. As chloroplast DNA is present in several copies, gene inserted in the chloroplast DNA gives a higher yield of the target biomolecules. The products are generally produced by the plant in their leaves, stumps or the tubers. Some of the common products that have been produced using this method includes the vaccine antigens, therapeutic proteins, diagnostic reagents, nutritional products, bioplastics or the industrial enzymes. We have a big list of uh, the uh, vaccine antigens, therapeutic proteins, diagnostic reagents, nutritional products, bioplastics or the industrial enzyme which are being produced in the plant and they are being successfully been uh, utilized into the industry. Then we have the transgenic plants, the so industrial productions. So the most common advantage of molecular forming is the safety and the purity of the obtained molecule. Plants are complex organisms that can provide a robust framework for post translational modification, which are often very important for the functionality of the proteins. Along with this, uh, using plant to produce complex biomolecule is a sustainable method with renewable sources. The first human made uh, biologist accepted by the FDA as a viable treatment for the Gaucher disease is Eliso, right. The enzyme was initially produced in the carrot cell culture, right. So, these are the some of the examples where which are being used in the industrial production. So, you can have a transgenic plant, this is the uh, therapeutic protein what you are going to use and this is the disease which it actually going to cure. So, if you have a lettuce, the transgenic lettuce, it is actually going to express the hepatitis B antigen and then it is actually going to give you the protection against the hepatitis B. Then we also have the transgenic tobacco which is actually going to have a cancer vaccine and then it is actually going to give you the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Then we have a transgenic carrot which is actually going to express the human glucocerebocytes and it is going to give you the cure against the gaucher disease and this is what we were talking about here, right. Then we have this uh, safflower, safflower is going to express the insulin and it is actually going to give you the cure or the management of diabetes. Then we also have the rice and where you are actually going to express the human lysozymes and it is actually going to be at anti-infection or the anti-inflammatory. Then the transgenic plants can also be used into the environmental taking care of the environmental issues. Remember that the plants are going to be used for not only managing the different types of the environmental um, byproducts which are being produced by the animals or from the industry, they are also being used for the sensing of the environmental thing. So, with the evolution of civilization, the amount of pollution has also increased with time. Plastics contribute to a sizable pollutant in the modern society. One of the most common invention of our time is the production of bioplastics that can be degraded by the nature over time. Transgenic plants are now exploited to produce the polyhydroxy alkanoids that an attractive and degradable alternative to the plastics. An example of PHA production is the production of bacterial polystyrene polyhydroxybutyrate or PHB. The gene responsible to produce the PHB, NLB, the PHA, PHB and the PHC are identified and isolated. These genes are incorporated in the sugar cane to produce the PHBs in transgenic sugar cane. Another important use of transgenic animal is the phytoremediation. So, phytoremediation means the removal of the toxins, right. It is the use of plant to remove the various pollutants from the environment. 
So, there are several types of bioremediations. For example, the phytostabilizations involve the immobilization of pollutant in a soil using the plants. Then we have phyto extraction. So, plant absorb the contaminants, particularly heavy metals from the soil. An example of this is producing the transgenic plant containing metal detoxifying genes. Then we also have the phyto degradation. This involves the uptake of organic pollutant and their degradations. Then we have the rhizofiltration. This involves the absorption, concentration and the precipitation of the organic pollutant from the aqueous environment. All of these have been possible by the production of the transgenic plant that contain a specialized gene to produce a sustainable method to clean our environment. Then we have uh, transgenic animals. So, transgenic animals are also having the application into the agricultural field. So, like transgenic plants, transgenic animals also have a wide variety of application into the agriculture. The increase in the quality of livestock which was earlier done via selective breeding can now be easily achieved by the transgenic methods. Engineered transgenic animals such as pig, sheep, cattle grow faster and more efficiently. For example, the transgenic salmon have been developed to grow to the market size in half the time of conventional salmon. Genetically modification makes livestock resistant to the certain diseases thus reducing the need for the medicine and improved animal welfare. An example of such modification is the transgenic chickens developed to resistance against the avian flu. Then the uh, transgenic animals are also being used in the molecular farming. Remember that the molecular farming means you are expressing a particular product into the uh, transgenic uh, organisms. Transgenic animals are used as a small bioreactor units to produce the normal as well as the recombinant protein in large quantity. The first example of such an animal was Tracy, a transgenic uh, that produced a large amount of alpha 1 antitrypsin in her milk. Deficiency of this protein in human caused the lung disease and thus the use of recombinant protein was thought to cure some of the symptoms of these diseases. In 1997, the first transgenic cow, the rosy, was created which produced the alpha lactoalbumin rich milk. This dairy was very balanced for human infant there than the normal cow milk. So, this is the sum of the uh, uh, animals uh, where you are actually expressing the different types of the uh, uh, proteins. So, you are expressing the albumin into a cow, you are expressing the alpha phyto protein which is a goat, then you are expressing the growth hormone into the goat and you are also expressing the tissue plasminogen activator which is in goat. Then you have a coagulation factor 9 which is in the mouse and then you also have a coagulation factor 8 which is in the rabbit. And remember that all these transgenic animals are very very important for the many types of applications. Then uh, nowadays the transgenic animals are engineered to produce the pharmaceutical protein in their milk, blood and eggs. Uh, goats have been modified to produce the antithrombin a protein used to prevent the blood clot. Additionally, the transgenic mice and other animals are engineered to produce the humanized antibodies which are critical for the development of treatment of various diseases including cancer and the autoimmune disorders. Then the transgenic animals are also being used in the research, right. So, transgenic animals are also used as a model for the study of the different physiological disorders. The, this gives the researcher a scope to identify the cause and cure of certain disease which are otherwise impossible to study in vitro. Even the application of certain drugs are initially performed on this transgenic animal model to check any adverse outcome before progressing to the uh, clinical trial or the human trials. For example, the transgenic mice have been engineered to develop the conditions like the Alzheimer disease, diabetes and cancer. This model helps the researchers understand the disease mechanism and test the potential treatment. Now, let us move on to the next topic and the next topic is uh, antisense technology. But before going into the next topic, let us summarize what we have discussed so far. We have discussed about the transgenic animals, we have discussed about how you can be able to uh, produce the transgenic animals. So, we have discussed about the how 
that you can be able to have the three different options you can be able to use the micro injections you can be able to use the stem cell technology and you can also be able to use the retrovirus methods once you develop the transgenic animals you can be able to use these transgenic animals for various types of applications and we have discussed about various types of transgenic animals which are being produced whether it is a glow fishes or salmon or whether we have developed the rabbits uh, transgenic rabbits or sheep or goat um, cows buffaloes and so on so uh, we have developed once you develop the transgenic animals uh, you can be able to use these transgenic organisms into different types of applications so you can use this for bioremediations you can use for the environmental monitoring you can use this for production of a protein products and so on so with this kind of elaborate discussion about the transgenic uh, organisms and the application of the combined ai technology to produce the transgenic organisms i would like to conclude my lecture here in our subsequent lecture we are going to discuss some more aspects of the applications of the recombinant ai technology thank you